the pre-dawn cold, 80,000 American soldiers slept on frozen ground. Unaware that only a few hundred yards away, 29 German divisions, more than 200,000 men, 1,900 assault guns and 950 armored vehicles lay in wait. Minutes before dawn, the GIs got a wake-up call straight out of hell. At 5.30 a.m., Hitler's big guns opened up, belching fire and death on the unsuspecting Americans. Three quarters of an hour later, as the guns fell silent, eight armored and 13 German infantry divisions crashed through trees, smoke and mist toward the American line. In the north and south, Generals Dietrich and Brandenberger had to establish hard shoulder emplacements, guarding the flanks of the advance and keeping the Americans from cutting them off. Without the hard shoulders, Manteuffel's 5th Panzer Army in the center would be vulnerable to attack from both sides. At the north end of the line, Dietrich knew he would have to contend with extremely rough terrain and dense forests in the Losheim Gap, an area relatively well guarded by the Americans. Spearheading the drive through the gap with orders to reach the Meuse River was SS Colonel Jochen Piper. Commanding 110 tanks and 4,000 men, Piper was young, handsome, intelligent, and brutally sadistic. A veteran of the horrific Russian front, Piper was the ideal choice to clean out the Losheim Gap. The Losheim Gap battle is simulated in scenario 1611, the northern flank in Bulge 44. Can we improve on Piper's performance? Game set up. Scenario 1611, northern flank. Allies automatic with fog of war. Uh, these are the options I'll be playing with. Okay. Turn 1. 3 of 17 HQs are out of command. So we should check the weather. Current weather, snow conditions, visibility 2 kilometers, and variable conditions could be expected during the scenario. Next, check units, releases. These units appear on the map, the 12th SS Panzer Division and the 1st SS Panzer Division. They will be in the fixed state and they will be released to us on 1600 hours on the 16th of December, which is turn 6. The Germans' use of deception units in the Bold campaign is somewhat famous, so let's see if they've been included in this scenario. Okay, just what is an Einheit Stylau 1, which is located at Hex 3526? So we can then go to view, hex by coordinate, complete 35, 26, okay there he is, it's a recon unit. Now if we right click its image or icon, you will see that it has the characteristic deception. Press F4 to bring up the parameters. Note the first value, axis range 5. So when we first deploy a deception unit, it can be three times its axis range from its starting position. So we know this unit's in column 35, so that means it could go as far left as 15 columns, which would take us to column 20. 
So if we check along column 20, we're looking for a location which has a lot of bridges, intersections and that type of thing. So this one here, or this area here, looks perfect. So we don't necessarily need to put the deception unit right on the bridge or the intersection because it will affect any, uh, any US unit moving in transport mode in a radius of 5 hexes. So by placing a deception unit in the current location you can see a radius of 5 includes all those important intersections, bridges and junctions in the area around that town. Axis effect 10%. This is the probability that the deception unit will have an effect. So i.e. it has one chance in 10 of causing disruption or loss of movement points. Axis damage 50%. If enemy engineers are within the radius of a deception unit and they are trying to blow up a bridge, this is the probability that the deception units will prevent that action. Axis detect 5%. At the beginning of each turn, there is a check to see if the deception units could be detected. So, in other words, there's a 1 in 20 chance that the deception units will be detected at the start of each turn. Of course there is no compulsion to put deception units into deception mode. They can be used in their default status which in this case is as recon units. So let's go back to the top of the map or the north of the map where we find in the mauve color the 272nd Volks Grenadier Division. This division was formed from the remnants of the veteran 272nd Infantry Division which had barely managed to escape from the Allied offensives following the Normandy landings. The 272nd ranks were filled with a large proportion of former Luftwaffe and Kriegsmarine personnel up to 50% by some estimates. The division performed credibly due in part to the large number of veteran commanders and non-commissioned officers it retained from the old 272nd Infantry Division. So at this stage nothing too scientific. Uh, we'll just move forward until we get contact with the enemy and see what happens from there. Perhaps we'll grab this guy interesting point about being at the foot of this hill you can probably see the contour line just here if you hit S note that we can see two hexes but because we're at the at this hill we can't see over the crest just a minor point on visibility so we'll move him up one more hex <coughs> and there you go he can see all the way um, to that town there so now I'll grab the other fellow up to the road. Might as well venture forward. Rightio. So, uh, so when we were back in this hex here, you may remember we could spot the town, but we can't see necessarily into it. So unless an enemy unit moves or fires uh, within our visibility range we can't spot them if they're in some sort of concealed cover. So fortunately we have a stack of artillery so although we have a a greyhound unit in a trench situation in a village so 70 percent protection but still we'll give him the artillery treatment <clears throat> okay, so this is the problem with trenches and particularly when they're in villages that they can be hard to dig out. Right, 
So we'll move our headquarters up. It needs to be in transport to go over the bridge. Move him up on the road. One more unit to move up. Obviously more expensive to move through the forest than it is out in the clear, so we'll move him into the clear first up. And that's pretty much it for the 272nd. Uh, what we're really looking at is making sure these lines of communication here in the north are blocked. I would imagine with these three battalions, um, that's probably all they could manage at this stage. We now move down to the 326th Volks Grenadier Division. The precursor to the 326th Volks Grenadier Division was the 326th Infantry Division and was the only Eastern Front veteran division to have fought in the Battles of Normandy, where it was destroyed. The plan for the 326th is to clear the road to the southwest and, if possible, uh, secure the steel bridge to the northwest. The idea is to trap any American units on the eastern side of the river against it. The capture of the bridge would force any supplies to take a longer route, which would have some marginal effect on American supply. The first priority is to deny the Americans their artillery. So the bulk of our artillery will be used against any um, artillery units that we find. As you will see in this scenario, the Germans have uh, plenty of artillery. So if you want to experiment with uh, artillery technique, this could be a good scenario to do it with. The first goal is to disrupt it. And hopefully with the excess artillery that we seem to have in stages, uh, we can in fact destroy what artillery assets the Amy's have initially. The pink formation is the 277th Volks Grenadier Division and was formed on September 4th, 1944 in Hungary. The original 277th Infantry Division was for all intents destroyed in the Battle of Normandy. Pretty obvious that the two secondary roads uh, leading to the southwest are going to be important and also to note along their route uh, secondary bridges so obviously an important mission for our engineers further down the track. Bridges are always important uh, in Panzer campaign games or scenarios but I think in the Battle of Ardennes or the Battle of the Bulge it's particularly critical. Now 
The starting position for the 277th isn't the greatest given we're in the middle of this forest so our movement is uh, quite slow. Uh, with the armoured units or vehicles you try and keep them on the roads if you can. So these guys, uh, it'll be interesting to see how these guys develop whether we push them back towards the road or whether we stay in a, a wide formation advancing. I can only imagine the stiffest defence will be along the road network. I'm moving these engineers to an important uh, road junction where there are four secondary bridges. Now we need to upgrade these bridges to so they can take the heavy tanks of the 12th Panzer Division. At this stage I imagine when they are released, uh, depending on the tactical situation, we need to have as many routes open as possible. So there's the one to the north or there's the more direct route to the 500 pointer, 500 pointer in the southwest. But for them to get there most efficiently means moving by road and making sure they have the adequate bridges in place. So even though we're still on turn one uh, we need to try and predict uh, where they may possibly go and as I say we don't really know but the more routes we have open uh, obviously more options the better. Let's have a look at the south of the map. The original 12th Infantry Division took part in the invasion of Poland and it was subsequently destroyed during the Soviet Operation Bagration in the summer of 44. Uh, it was reactivated in September 44 as a Volksgrenadier Division. Its role will be to clear the road to its immediate front and it has extensive artillery support to complete this mission. As per our standing operating procedure, we'll pound the Amy artillery out of the battle.
As I'm going through the artillery units, I'm trying to identify those which have higher anti-hard or anti-armour capability because we seem to be bumping into a lot of uh, greyhounds which are classified as a hard target. So rather than attack them with infantry, I'd, I'd rather have them infantry and perhaps some anti-tank gun support. So we're certainly flush with anti-soft uh, capability at the moment but uh, we won't get the really quality anti-hard firepower until the two Panzer Div SS Panzer Divisions join us. You've probably noticed that trenches are hard enough to attack as it is, never mind bunkers and pillboxes. So really, uh, it'd be very nice with this amount of artillery to at least get them to a disruption stage. But it is a decision you have to make, as uh, in most scenarios you don't have uh, limitless artillery and sometimes pounding trenches isn't the best way to use them so while I always uh, give the artillery a chance to disrupt defenders in trenches I usually find that you have to have a balance between the artillery and the cost of an assault I find it's often best to have an assault move the defenders out of the trench and then blat them with the artillery when they don't have the benefit of that protection. The light orange unit is the 3rd Fallschirmjäger Division. It performed very well in the Normandy battle, but it was virtually destroyed by aerial bombardment in the area of Falaise. It was then formed again in Belgium from replacements from Luftwaffe field regiments. I have a go at uh, recon spotting with this uh, particular unit and we managed to spot something two hexes away. I was alluding to this issue a little while ago where there seems to be these greyhounds all over the map which are hard targets and we only have uh, infantry to attack them with so pretty important we try and get uh, the right unit attacking the right type of uh, enemy unit so I'm hoping to get some of the anti-tank guns up to give them some assistance but sometimes you just have to plough on with what you've got. You will often find with anti-tank guns when you're in the attack that you end up chasing units around the map a bit because you never quite get there. So the real idea with these greyhounds is like that chap who just uh, surrounded the greyhound to pin them in place then you bring up the anti-tank gun to help finish them off. So from this point here was basically a lot of admin type moves, uh, moving units 
forward that uh, are eligible to do so. Trying to move the any tank guns towards uh, suitable targets. in preparation for the next turn. I think it's been a reasonable first turn. The first turn is always uh, the busiest and the longest. Uh, you need to think about your general plans for your combat and movement. Um, of course, and that changes depending on what happens when you bump into the opposition. But at this stage, I think everything's going reasonably well. As you could imagine, fighting in the Ardennes, it's not, not the huge movement part at this stage. But we have to fight our way through about a what four to six hex forest barrier before we get uh, to the easier going. But the scenario does suggest that the Amy's are in defence in depth so it could be uh, just hacking our way forward so we have 15 turns in this scenario so it looks like it's going to be a bit of a fun one um, a bit of old-fashioned smashing and maybe some high-speed movement towards the end as we make a dash for the victory locations uh, it'll be good to get the SS Panzer Division's heavy armour out and hopefully get them a clear path to the internals of the Amy position and see what we can blast. But uh, we'll see how we go. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation of my first turn of the northern flank scenario, otherwise known as the Losheim Gap. So just using uh, the remainder of the artillery, always worthwhile checking uh, the artillery dialogue before you hit the end of turn button. So there we go, turn two. Well, let's see what progress we make next time. Cheers, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you next time round.